Coming up on this edition of the Desert Vision, soldiers test for one of the Army's hardest badges to earn, and a neon fun run sheds bright light to raise suicide awareness. Welcome to this edition of the Desert Vision. I'm Army Sergeant Heath Graham. Troops and Department of Defense personnel going in and out of theater will now move through one gateway exclusively. Army Staff Sergeant Alvin Spencer explains how the move saves money for the military. The 138 Theater Gateway Personnel Accountability Team hosted a ribbon cutting ceremony to mark the opening of the gateway for deploying troops and DOD personnel. The motivation for closing the life support area at Ali Asalim um, was uh, really came down to a financial decision. Uh, we were spending roughly $35 million a year to operate the gateway at the LSA um, at Ali Asalim, and so the decision was made to close the life support area. And what that meant is that the gateway function would need to be restationed somewhere. This move reduces the military's footprint in the area of operations. Reporting from Camp Averagon, Kuwait, I'm Army Staff Sergeant Alvin Spencer. Four soldiers at Camp Averagon earned the right to join one of the Army's most prestigious clubs. The biography of Sergeant Artie Leon Murphy. These non-commissioned officers are some of the newest members of the Sergeant Artie Murphy Club. War hero. The club recognizes and inducts NCOs who go above and beyond in achieving their goals, have genuine care and concern for other soldiers as well as their community, and perform the high-level tasks it takes to join. Oh, I feel a huge sense of accomplishment, um, putting a lot of hard work, a um, lot of long hours, studying and um, just doing this every day on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, taking care of soldiers, and that's what the club really represents. Receiving the medal means being held to the highest standard of professionalism and setting that example for other soldiers. We don't need medallion holders. Uh, what I look forward to is sergeants who join the club to go out and do volunteer work. They walk like a soldier, they talk like a soldier, and they give the true image of what the United States Army is trying to project, and that's professionalism. Once inducted into the Sergeant Audie Murphy Club, members are expected to continue contributing to their communities and find and mentor new recruits. A much larger group of soldiers had the opportunity to earn a prestigious badge of their own. Add harsh desert conditions, and these candidates were in for an intense testing cycle. Extreme heat, mental and physical exhaustion, and performing under intense pressure were some of the obstacles that soldiers faced trying to earn the expert field medical badge at Camp Buring, Kuwait. Take care of this. Just keep an eye on the other fellow for me. I got it, Doc. Qualification lasted 120 hours and provided little sleep for the soldiers between events. I'm trying to remember all the different steps and not just memorizing for the lean, but actually genuinely learning, you know, learning it as we go and being able to apply this later on. So, yeah, mental and physical exhaustion. <laughs> the EFMB qualification started with 138 soldiers, but only a fraction of that number remained for the 12-mile ruck march that would qualify these soldiers as expert field medics, proving it as one of the Army's toughest badges to earn. Regardless of whether or not uh, a soldier earns the badge, uh, every soldier that competes that goes through the standardization week, uh, it will definitely hone their skills as a medic. Every soldier that leaves here will be a better medic when they leave. This is the first testing for the expert field medical badge in Kuwait in over a decade. 21 soldiers passed the testing cycle, marking them among the Army's most elite medical providers. After a decade of working with the Army's customs program, the Navy handed authority to the U.S. Air Force. Army Sergeant Catherine Dowd has the story. The U.S. Army Customs Program is a joint operation that has been manned by U.S. Navy forces for the past 10 years. In a transfer of authority ceremony on October 11th, the U.S. Air Force took the mission over. Navy Commander Tony Erickson was the last commander for the Navy Customs mission. This is the final rotation of the Navy uh, uh, Customs uh, in CENTCOM AOR and uh, most likely for the war here. You never know what's going to happen though and uh, the Navy's always prepared to stand by for that. The program is managed by the U.S. Army's 1st Theater Sustainment Command. The mission is essential for the movement of vehicles and equipment from the Gulf region back to the United States. 
Air Force John Lieutenant Daniel. Colonel Daniel Johnstone tells why the Customs mission is so important. The mission is critical because we're not only protecting the United States from a myriad of potential dangers, but we're also maintaining relationships with foreign countries by ensuring the U.S. doesn't ship contaminated material to their transportation channels. General Tatum, we embrace this mission. We understand its importance, and I promise you we will succeed. The transition was smooth and shows the fluidity of the U.S. Armed Forces. Reporting from Camp Air of John Kuwait, I'm Army Sergeant Catherine Dow. Colonel Chris Eubank, Area Support Group Kuwait Commander here. I want to talk to you real quick about safety around Kuwait. We've had a recent change in a policy for the wear of the PT belt while in uniform. It is no longer necessary to wear the PT belt while in uniform. The only time you have to wear it is hours of darkness while conducting PT. Having said that, I want everybody to remain safe. Remember to look both ways before you cross the street. And remember, safety is everybody's business. Thank you. Welcome back. Soldiers from Camp Erevjan volunteered their time at a local Kuwait animal shelter. Army Sergeant Catherine Dowd tells us how these volunteer efforts make an impact on community connection. <laughs> Civil affairs professionals play an essential role in maintaining good relations with local communities wherever the Army is deployed. One of the ways the first TSC Civil Affairs is doing that in Kuwait is through volunteer efforts at a local animal shelter called Kay's Path. Great organization here. Uh, today we're just helping them out with a little refurbishing around the uh, new barn that they're putting up so their horses can be indoors. The managing director of the shelter, a U.S. Air Force veteran, said that volunteers like these soldiers help keep things running smoothly. You know, as a veteran, I've, I've always loved working with um, any U.S. military forces. I've, I've been in your shoes, I've been deployed here, I've been deployed in worse places than here. Um, I know what it's like to be, you know, to feel like you're stuck there most of the time. Um, this is a, a great outlet for you. I, I love being able to offer this to, to any of the troops. Programs like this bring soldiers and the local population together. I think it's important to at least maintain good relations with the Kuwaitis as, we, as we've had in the past. And part of that is getting out here and, uh, and engaging with them on a community level. Reporting from Camp Air of John Kuwait, I'm Army Sergeant Catherine Dowd. One of the Army's biggest campaigns is raising suicide awareness. Specialist Anthony Kozluchar shows us how 1st Armor Brigade Combat Team adds physical fitness and remembrance to highlight this cause. Enthusiastic participants took part in the Sarah Smile Neon Splash Dash. The run is part of the Raider Brigade's suicide awareness activities. Sergeant First Class Robert Britt, the father of Sarah, came to Camp Buring to raise awareness about the tragedy of suicide. Well, I started the Sarah Smile Foundation when I lost my daughter, Sarah. She was 16 years old, and I found her in her room. She had hung herself in her closet. I went into a major depression because nothing can even describe the pain of losing a child. And when I give my briefings and my presentations, I want to bring the reality to it. You know, what I went through, what my children went through, what her mother went through. It really hits home to people. And my last slide that I show my slide presentation is a grave site and her headstone. And that's the reality of it. The USO joined the team and lent their support to the 5K fun run. The Splash Dash, um, there are five different pillars of wellness. Each one is associated with a different color. And so similar to a color run, we're going to be throwing, literally, paint on people. So, and then there's 15,000 gallons of water and they have to go through this one. One of the splash zones is going to be um, somewhat of a mud pit. The idea is that they start off pretty much clean, maybe wearing a white shirt and whatnot, and then we're going to have paint thrown on them all throughout the race. And by the end, they'll be tie-dyed, and then we set them in front of a black light, and it looks awesome. 
It's a different way to tackle a serious problem. To do something like this, to celebrate life, to have a 5K run, have a fun day and a barbecue, and talk about the issues at hand with suicide and behavior health. I've never seen anything like it. You know, it's better than sitting in a classroom and just checking the block. People are going to remember suicide awareness for a while, and that's what matters. This is Specialist Anthony Kozluchar reporting for the 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team, Camp Uring, Kuwait. Suicide is a tragedy that has a lasting effect on everyone. Senior Airman Corey Schuler sits down with a soldier who experienced this effect firsthand. He said that his music would change the world. That was his goal, that he was going to make music that was going to that was going to impact others and I so wish that that time could come. My son Tay was uh, 14. I think what he was dealing with is he never really talked about my mother's passing. And I think that her birthday kind of brought up uh, his memories of her, and he kind of didn't know how to deal with it. When he came home, something just wasn't right. I was like, all right, well, I'll just go back and check. And as soon as I turned the corner, uh, he's kind of lifted himself up on a tie. The tie was hung around his neck. It was tied to the top of the top of the closet where you hang your clothes. We laid him on the floor. I went straight into CPR. Um, I was trying to do CPR constantly over and over and over. Uh, we weren't getting a response. We lost. We lost my 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 first and only son. We had to go through the natural funeral arrangements uh, with my son. Uh, he's buried right next to my mom, so I know uh, he's being washed over. It was kind of a realization that my son passed away on my mother's birthday. If he would have talked to myself or a teacher or even a distant person that doesn't even know him from from anyone else that he would at least gotten some help and he would have been able to talk at least to somebody and to realize that this is not what I need to do. If anything I could tell that soldier, airman, marine or even seaman is that they need to realize that their life is valuable. No matter how they see it to someone else their life is so valuable. It, it is so many other things that you can do. It's not the end. It is definitely not the end. People have overcome hurdles, bad points in their life all the time. Anything can be overcome, anything. That does it for this edition of The Desert Vision. For these stories and more, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash US Army Central. Thanks for watching.